In 1981, the deadliest building collapse in the United States at the time took place right here. More than 2,000 people filled this room for a group dance celebration. But only seconds into the dance, two suspended walkways broke away and crashed to the ground, killing 114 people and injuring 200 more. There was no earthquake or explosion that triggered this tragedy, though. Instead, a series of oversights and poor decisions during the design process gradually eroded the structure's integrity until it was constructed only 30% as strong as it should have been. That's how this event became widely known as one of the greatest building design failures in recent history. The skywalks spanned 120 feet, or about 40 meters, across a dazzling lobby in the newest Hyatt Regency Hotel. Only a year earlier, this was the 52nd Regency to open up in a single decade. Hyatt simply couldn't build these kinds of buildings fast enough, and this lobby was central to their new hotel concept. By combining easy access to lounges, bars, shops, and pools, the lobby functioned as a kind of European plaza in the middle, an enclosed city of leisure where guests could eat, relax, and ultimately spend their money. This successful model generated revenue for the hotel and tax income for cities that were struggling with disinvestment at the time. But to succeed, these lobbies needed to be truly spectacular and exceptional. Hyatt called it the JC effect, when the lobby's grandeur practically forces new arrivals to exclaim, Jesus Christ, the moment that they walk in. This design approach first debuted in Atlanta, where they used three key elements, height, light, and life. There, the atrium soared upward for a dramatic sense of scale, the natural illumination pours in then from the top, and the corridors line the exterior of the atrium to create a lively atmosphere, while glass elevators provide constant motion up and down. Kansas City's version, though, it diverges quite a bit from that successful script. Its guest rooms, they sit off to the side in a pretty standard tower structure, while the amenities, like the pool and the ballroom, all occupy a separate, smaller structure off to the side. And then the lobby then sits in between as a kind of pavilion that connects these two different wings. Initially, architect Bob Berkabeel used a model just like this one to show his vision for a, a marble-lined courtyard, like something you might find out in Milan, with large west-facing windows to capture the setting sun. He imagined a 135-seat cocktail lounge on the ground floor level, plus a second-level terrace cafe with about 250 seats overlooking that lobby. Representatives from Hyatt just were not impressed with this initial scheme. It was just less dynamic and even less efficient than the Atlanta version, where the hallways allowed visitors constant contact with the lobby. So to achieve that true JC effect, he suggested adding skywalks to bring people through more efficiently on more levels and give the space an extra, quote-unquote, something. Berkabeel went back to work, but he was obviously a little bit frustrated. The skywalks, they were not part of his initial vision at all, so it was difficult to really shoehorn them into the design. After 10 months of tweaking everything and testing different models, Berkabeel emerged with a final design scheme, a series of slim, ceiling-hung walkways designed to appear as, quote, thin and invisible as possible. Normally, this would not have been an issue at all, but this was far from a normal situation. If it were normal circumstances, the design team, they'd have another two years to figure out how to build these kinds of skywalks. But the developer, a subsidiary of the Hallmark Corporation, required that this hotel be operational as soon as possible. Each month that the hotel sat unfinished on the property meant roughly $500,000 in lost fees, taxes, escalations, and revenue. But the developer proposed overlapping the design and the construction phases for this project. That way, they could trim more than a year off the schedule. This is called fast-tracked construction. While the shaved time adds to the developer's bottom line, the architects and the engineers absorb most of the added stress and risk. Every missed memo or rushed calculation can snowball into a fatal mistake. Because these skywalks, they were conceived later in the design process, as I mentioned. The architects and engineers ended up with only a few months to finalize their critical details. And it's here where the problem comes in. Here's how the process unfolded. After deciding on the design, the architects produced the official construction documents, the legal quote-unquote intent of construction. Pages like this are labeled with the letter A. These documents went to Jack Gillum, the structural engineer hired for the project. He interpreted them, performed the necessary calculations, and then issued his own structural drawings labeled with an S. Both sets are bound together and then sent off to the general contractor, who hires subcontractors for doing specialized work. Haven Steel, for instance, handled all steel fabrication and installation in this project. So they created what are called shop drawings and erection drawings, detailing exactly how each component would be built. They created 42 of these shop drawings, which were returned to Gillum for review. He would normally verify that those drawings meet the code and match the design intent 
before applying his professional engineer's stamp to the drawings, effectively accepting liability for any design errors. In theory, this is how you're supposed to maintain quality control inside of a complex construction project like this. But as we know, the final Skywalk design was not up to code, even though it carried that structural engineer's seal. If they had reviewed those drawings first, they would have caught the fact that there were several glaring issues on pages S303 through S305. According to those drawings, each skywalk would have been supported by what are called box beams, hollow rectangular sections that are formed by welding two steel channels together, through which a one and one quarter inch steel rod was supposed to run from the ceiling all the way down to the lower walkway. In theory, a nut and washer beneath the box beam would keep the beam suspended. But this is not the way this should have been built. It should have included a welded plate to the beam's underside and reinforcement in its interior to prevent any deformation of the beam and so that the washer doesn't pull through the box beam. Even then, this proposed detail was already pushing the limits and wasn't up to code because it was 60% of the strength that was actually required by code. But because safety margins are built into most structural guidelines, this might still have eked by and worked if it had been executed exactly as those originally planned. So. But why did it fail? Well, because it got a lot worse. The fabricator Haven Steel found it difficult to maneuver that single continuous rod all the way from the ceiling straight down to the lower walkway on the second floor, from the fourth floor to the second. So they proposed a simple fix. Split the rod into two separate pieces and overlap them at the top floor walkway. At a glance, that doesn't look like a major change, but structurally, it makes the middle box beam carry double the load. Both its skywalk and the one below it, when in the original design, everything was supposed to be carried up into the ceiling. This box beam was not designed for this condition, and this one modification slashed the system's overall capacity from an already weak 60% to a dire 30% of the minimum required strength. The beams here weren't just under code. They were wholly unfit to bear the weight of even the walkways themselves, let alone any crowd that might be gathering on them. All of these changes in the design they happened while the construction charged forward on the rest of the hotel. Yet, there were signs of trouble with the construction even before they got to the walkways. On October 14, 1979, 2,700 square feet of the atrium's roof collapsed during construction. They halted work while an independent engineering firm investigated, and they found multiple issues and a, quote, lack of adequate design. Those external engineers offered to review everything in the structure, and they estimated that would take about 700 hours of additional work. But Hallmark, they declined that study. So the investigators, they wrapped up the roof report and the roof was rebuilt without any attention given to the far more dangerous conditions lurking in the Skywalk plans. On July 17th, 1981 at 7.05 PM, the washers tore through the fourth floor Skywalk's box beam, sending it crashing into the Skywalk below and then ultimately to the lobby floor. Emergency responders, they arrived in minutes, some using makeshift stretchers to carry the wounded across the shattered glass. Survivors recalled the sudden hush of the atrium, broken by the cries for help, something nobody expected in such a glamorous hotel lobby. Soon after this tragedy, focus shifted quickly to assigning blame, even at the expense of grieving for the victims, as fear and uncertainty fueled the rush to find a culprit and who was responsible. Nearly all of what we know today comes from the National Bureau of Standards Investigation. They took over 220 days, totaling 15 men years of work, as NBS researchers dissected every aspect of the collapse. Until their findings were released, much of what circulated was just speculation. And just like construction, conflicting motives and agendas still stood in the way. NBS butted heads with police, who wanted the collapse site left untouched. Hallmark also resisted, going as far as chaining the door of the room that was holding the construction drawings so no one could see them. In an attempt to head off legal battles and negative PR, Hallmark offered $1,000 to anyone who had been in the lobby at the time, plus $6.5 million in donations to charitable causes. But everything changed once NBS published their 349-page report outlining exactly what went wrong. Civil lawsuits exploded, and before the criminal investigations were concluded, insurance companies had paid out over $140 million. Meanwhile, Hyatt's owners compensated claimants, but only after they were released from further liability, setting a precedent that was later applied in other high-profile cases, such as the 2020 mass shooting in Las Vegas. The criminal proceedings, on the other hand, they were another story. The public demanded that someone be punished. And prosecutors, they examined a litany of potential charging options, manslaughter or perjury, or even criminal conspiracy. 
Yet after what authorities describe as an extensive and exhaustive inquiry, no one was found guilty of criminal misconduct in the end which everyone found justifiably deeply unsatisfying. How could a professional blunder this huge not count as a crime? American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE, stepped in to ensure that they did their part at least. Determined to fix a system that was rife with finger pointing, the ASCE declared the structural engineer was ultimately responsible for clarifying job site misunderstandings. So they stripped Gillum of his engineering license and they revoked the entire company's ability to practice. They also codified new principles in a 192-page manual of professional practice that was backed by interviews that they conducted with more than 1,000 experts. The manual tightened industry requirements, promoted clearer communications across all of the teams, and mandated independent engineering oversight for any project changes. It also spurred conferences and courses in ethics and accountability in university engineering curricula, ensuring that future generations would learn from the mistakes that doomed the Hyatt Skywalks. Which was a reminder that even though architecture and engineering seems like it's about buildings, it's ultimately about people. The victims, the different perspectives and motivations that the clients have in a project like this, and who the building serves. Yet I think much too often the process behind the creation of buildings like this is mired in paperwork and competing priorities that muddies the waters of stuff like that. And I think that this disaster forced our entire industry to reckon with the fact that even the smallest oversight, a missing plate or some like unverified drawing or a miscommunication somewhere can cost lives. And then we need to take more responsibility in standing up for what it really takes to ensure that our environment is inspiring, but also to be safe. And this often comes down to balancing decisions about when to go in and fix potential problems and when to just ride it out. If tragedy strikes, it becomes painfully obvious in hindsight, but when it comes to preparing to potential dangers, that's when it's not so clear. Take wildfire preparation, for instance. To protect neighborhoods and homes against them means costly retrofits, not only financially, but also to the historic fabric of neighborhoods. A fire-resistant community will likely look much different than one that the homeowners bought into. I have a brand new video that explores the design of that house and the features that helped it survive the recent Los Angeles fires. If you usually only catch me here on YouTube, you're missing out on a ton of content like the building tours or the behind the scenes look at my new studio and those we only post on Nebula. But it's not just my videos. Nebula is powered by over 200 creators, including Hoog and City Nerd and Real Engineering, making it one of the most innovative streaming platforms out there. By pooling our resources, we can push each other to create even better, more ambitious projects. Some of the best content on Nebula comes from our original productions, where bigger budgets let us experiment with brand new ideas. For example, check out Neo's Underexposure, some of the most compelling documentary storytelling out right now. Nebula offers flexible subscription plans, monthly, annual, and yes, even a lifetime option. That means you can pay once and have access to everything Nebula ever creates forever. So start by catching that fascinating look into that fireproof house in LA by clicking the link on the screen or in the description, or scan the QR code. You'll save 40% off your Nebula subscription with my link and never miss a video again. It only costs $3 a month when you sign up for a year. Plus, you'll be right at the heart of a media movement that's changing how creators and audiences connect. Check it out. And as always, thank you so much for watching. See you over on Nebula.